I would suggest uh, the reason to spend a little bit of time talking about restorative justice before getting into the specifics of court watching is that when we court watch, hopefully you're using a reparative lens uh, through which you observe the proceedings and uh, observe and then begin to ask questions uh, about a lot of why questions. Why is this happening? Why are these folks here, et cetera? So when you're court watching, whether it's on the juvenile level or on the adult level, and you're beginning to understand the system, who the players are, what the procedures are, et cetera, and you're asking questions about this boy or this girl, then you began asking questions about this group of boys or this group of boys, and how do we handle, how can we, how can we push for systemic responses that makes sense and call for accountability. So, um, so it's a process uh, to go through. But that's one of the things where you have to do your homework. So if you're going to go talk to public officials and advocate for a certain outcome, you got to know the facts. So you can't say that every kid that goes in juvenile justice system goes to jail. They just don't. I will. How would we find out those facts? Well, you got to figure out who 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 has the data. You know, who has the numbers. Make a freedom of information request. You know. You know, that's what you have to do. You have to, and this is what I what we're doing in Des Moines. We, we, we moved from a lot of people being concerned about how kids are treated, and we're making community organizers professionals. We're professionalizing community organizing. You know, they do court watching, okay, they do research, we make freedom of information requests. We do trainings on how to have conversations with judges how to have conversations with probation officers and with legislators and with DAs, you know. So you can't go to meetings just saying, you're, you're locking all of our kids up. You need to know, you're locking 20% of our kids up, or whatever it is, but you, you've got to know the facts, okay? You can't just, you can't just shoot from the hip or shoot from the heart, you know. It's probably really bad, but you've got to know to what extent it's bad. And that's why you do court watching, and that's why you need to know what happens to a case. That's why you need to know, is there, can you get services in this county for juveniles if the kid is an informal court? That's a threshold question right there. You've got to know that. You've got to know the answer to that. Because if you can, then when you do court watching and you're looking at a situation, you say, why, was, why is this kid in court? Because I've found out that this is available some kids over here. There's money allocated for this kind of supervision, for curfew, for class, uh, for drug screening, you know, for whatever. That this is available over on this side without having to file. I don't know the answer for you. I know wherever, where other places I go that yes, that money is available. In fact, what happened when we reduced court filings on kids by 50 percent, it took probation officers who were accustomed to spending a lot of their time sitting outside juvenile courtrooms because the courtrooms were full and it allowed them to get shifted over to the informal side and have more meaningful contact with kids. <laughs> they could suddenly do home visits instead of hanging around the courthouse waiting to be called in to testify. You know? So <coughs> you got to know the system. Okay. And you got to know the numbers. Okay? Could you describe the court watcher training program? Yeah, that's what we're going to do right now. Oh, that's okay. what we're doing today? Yep, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's not the football training, but we're going to get you. Oh. We're going to get you enough so that you want to have more. <laughs> <laughs> now, how long does it usually take to train court vouchers is the question. Uh, the, the one that we do is two hours. Okay, that's the question. Two hours. Okay. We're doing the accelerated version. We're doing the accelerated version so that you can go back to your churches or whatever um, and, do, and do some additional work on it. Okay. It's just that we were asked to give to do a restorative justice primer getting in. And I, 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 quite frankly, I think it's important because if you don't understand the system and how we got to where we are, <laughs> then you don't know what to look for when you're court watching. Okay. But if you don't understand the system and you were in place and you brought about some change, and yet when you left, it all went bad. It's very, Good this lesson. Is very, this is very depressing. <laughs> yeah. It is. yeah, I was in therapy. <laughs> That's what I didn't know. 
That's exactly what I did not and woke up to. When I retired, I started doing graduate work in conflict transformation, think I was going to go overseas and solve the Palestinian problem. Right? Okay? So uh, I was approached about a year after I retired by a group in Des Moines called Amos, a mid-Iowa organizing strategy. It's 30 churches, okay, that do community organizing around social justice issues. They had done a series of what they call home meetings, okay? They've gone into about 300 homes, doing one-on-one -one interviews, finding out what is it that's really affecting families in our community. Number one on the list, overwhelmingly, is what the justice system is doing to our kids. So they approached me, they knew about my restorative justice work, and said, Fred, will you, will, you help, will you help educate us about this system? So the group, much like your group, okay, uh, more churches involved, but nevertheless, similar kind of energy, created, first of all, the very first step was, not going and raising hell, the very first step was to create a research team. So we created a research team of 10 people, four or five of them ministers, okay? And we started looking at the data, finding out, first of all, figure out where do we get the data, okay? So, you have every right to ask your clerk of court to give you the filing statistics on delinquents in this county for a calendar year. So that's one thing you look at. If you go to the police and you get arrest data per calendar year, okay? And then you and then you go to your detention center and you get detention statistics. You know, who's being detained? What's their color? Okay? What are their offenses? Okay? So you have to do your homework. Okay. Okay. Somebody has to do it. I'm not saying all of you do it. Somebody has to. And, and, and we were fortunate to find sort of like statistics geeks, you know. We got a guy, he's wonderful, named Bob Glass, he was a DHS social worker for years, and he's a statistics geek, and he will not take no for an answer when it comes to getting the data. So you have to have the data. So we had the data, then we started teaching restorative justice classes in churches, black churches, white churches, combining the two. Read the new Jim Crow, right? And looked at the data, talked about restorative justice over a number of weeks. And then we had a huge community meeting, okay? In a church, in a Unitarian church, and 150 people. We laid out what we've been doing, and we said, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? How do you want to join in this effort? Are you concerned or not? If you're concerned, let, let us show you some things you can do. Do you want to be a court watcher? Okay, and we laid out what was, what might you might be the benefit of that. Do you want to do school mediation? Do you want to get upstream from the formal system? Do you want to be a peacemaker in schools and thereby reduce suspensions and arrest? Okay? So when I was a prosecutor, I put a mediator once a week in each of our five public high schools. We reduced suspensions by 50% by having once a week a mediator from the community every single Tuesday or every single Wednesday, depending on the high school, doing one mediation, doing five mediations back to back, reduce suspensions and arrests, okay, by getting upstream, so if you can get upstream, if you can keep kids getting from suspended, then you can keep them, hopefully, from getting into the, the, the system, right, okay, so then, we kept hearing about, uh, let's see, so we did that, we, we did, created a school, we created a court watch training, we'll get to that in a second, school mediation, get upstream, then we kept hearing about, um, uh, particularly in meetings and trainings we're doing with the African American community, we kept hearing about racial profiling. We approached the police, we had a research team, we had ministers involved, and they said, we don't have racial profiling. <laughs> so every once in a while somebody makes a complaint, but when we dig deep, we realize it's, oh, it wasn't profiling, it was something else. Well, right? You know, because if you sit for any length of time in an African American church in their basement, have a conversation, you know it's part of their lives. It's a daily part of their lives. So we created a racial profiling project in cooperation with the law school. We trained law students and others to do interviews of victims of racial profiling. Told the police what we were doing. Ah, uh, blew us off. So we had a press conference. Suddenly they wanted to talk. And they created a racial profiling task force. Okay. And then we're able to get the data from them on disproportionate contact by the police in schools and on the streets. So there, there's a lot of facets of this, but one one is, you know, I believe we need peacemakers by the, 
uh, the button, right? To do school mediations, to do circles, to do victim better dialogue, all those things. You also need a core group that's going to keep the foot to the pedal, getting the data, sitting down, having conversations. So the last thing we did just recently, well, we did we, a year ago, you know, we became convinced that public officials, for the most part, were either oblivious to or ignored the research on early childhood trauma and uh, juvenile brain development. So we said, well, let's do a day-long TED Talk on that in conjunction with the medical school in Des Moines and the largest state, uh, uh, what do we call it, children's hospital, okay? We thought we'd have 200 people. We had 800 people show up for a We spent a third of the day on early childhood trauma, a third of the day on juvenile brain development, and a third of the day on restorative justice. What restorative justice has to stay about kids, keeping in mind what we've learned from the scientist about trauma <coughs> and brain development, okay? And that, then we got even more people saying, we want to be involved in this, <coughs> okay? We, 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 we believe that public officials, people who make decisions in our juvenile criminal justice systems have an absolute ethical responsibility to be informed about the research and make decisions commensurate with that research, okay? So that's, that's another piece that's just, uh, just a piece of it. Just recently, we had a day-long training for like our 30 sort of top people, and it was at a church. Almost all of our meetings are at churches. We spent the whole day educating ourselves on how to rise to the next level of expertise. Because what we do is, I have a meeting when I get back to the point next week with the police chief, and always four or five of us go to these meetings. And we found out early on, if you go unprepared, they will dismiss you, right? And you'll get nowhere. But if you go prepared, if you know this, if you have the data, right, and you go with a willingness to cooperate, if they will cooperate, then you can get some, you can get some. So uh, we've taken that course of action with the police, all starting with court watching, quite frankly. Uh, that sort of got us on the map, <coughs> court watching. Uh, so uh, now with the police, we're not in an adversarial position at all. We've created the second chance mediation program. They send us cases to mediate with juvenile offenders. They don't send it to the county attorney's office. I'm not saying all of them, but they're sending us meaningful cases that otherwise would have gone into the formal justice system, and we're mediating those cases out there. Okay? We're doing community justice circles where white police officers sit in a peacemaking circle with black teenagers, talk about race, talk about respect, disrespect, talking about their childhood, and they're incredible. And it's bridging the gap between police and kids. So uh, there's just all these, I mean, I'm not saying, we don't have a blueprint at all for this, but we have learned that you got to do your homework first. You do your homework by getting the data, by having a core group that will really get the data, okay? You do court watching so that a lot of people begin to look at what justice looks like in their courthouses, in their courthouse, through a restorative lens. And, and then the questions keep coming up. And then people rise to become leaders. It's incredible how people have risen to become leaders in this effort who otherwise were quiet or, you know, et cetera. So somebody had a question. I was just wondering, um, I was at the meeting you had with the judges and the prosecutors the first time you were here. Yeah. And I heard the prosecutor saying, we don't keep that kind of information. I've also been trying to work on research on the Michigan Department of Corrections, and we can't get any data from them either. Oh, good. And I wonder well, how you know, use the FOIA to get Yeah, it. you got to do that. <coughs> I'll give you a, a quick example. So, a year and a half ago, we're sitting down with the interim police chief, and he gives us data that we've been asking for for a year. The, the previous police chief had retired at the end of September. He took over 1st of October. We're meeting with him three weeks later, and he gives us the data that we've been asking for for a year and a flight. Okay. So we know it's there. Okay. Last November, or just a few months back, I sent a request to the police chief. We would like the data from when the last report ended through November 1. Okay. Email back. Uh, we'll work on it. Okay. So two months later, I get nothing back. So I sent an email saying, just want to remind you about my request in November. You know, and I copied, I copied in, um, I 
the Wayne Register as well. <laughs> the editorial board. Uh, uh, no, that was on the first one. That was on the first one. On the second one, I didn't do that. And I get nothing for 10 days. And I'm pissed, quite frankly. You know, because I know that his predecessor in three weeks was able to get us the data. And here we are, two months plus 10 days out. So I sent him a very polite, but curt email saying, um, just following up on my email from 10 days ago, um, and not heard back from you. Uh, would you prefer that I make a Freedom of Information request? In 10 minutes, he's on the phone with me. <laughs> I've got Sergeant Al Tons on it. He'll have it in two weeks. Okay. So it's like, you know, what I've learned in community organizing is, uh, you know, you, you don't get changed for being nice. Okay. You have to develop relationships. Absolutely. Uh, but when you got to bring out a stick, you bring out a stick, you know. And the stick, when it comes to this data stuff, is a freedom of information request, you know. Court watching. Okay, court watching. <laughs> <laughs> so court watching. Why do we court? Yes. I just want to say, um, right now, courts are exempt from the FOIA in Michigan. Yes, they are. Right now, there's legislation pending to expand freedom of information. Um, Act coverage and people should contact their legislators and say they're in favor of expanded coverage. Well, when you say they're exempt, are you talking about the clerk? The clerk of court is exempt from a freedom of information request. Well, you know, I'm not actually sure on that point, but um, they do do um, reports to the state court administrator's office, so they do report some information. But I don't think the courts track race, for example. Um, even if you could get the information. So. But, but the police do. Right, right. So one source doesn't give you the whole picture. Right. Okay. What some of them the, are exempt. Right. And, but what you want from the clerk of court is only filings. They're only required to give you under mission. We're ranked, I think it was 50 in the, in the United States in terms of open government just <laughs> recently. Transparency. There's but, no transparency. Um, they're only required to give you data that they already collect. So they do not have to like, well, put together have you reports. To, have you gone to your clerk of court to see what information they have? No, I'm just um, giving information okay. to You people. need to go to your clerk of court, somebody, a group of you, and just find out. They absolutely collect filing statistics because every case is filed gets a number, right? right? Now, judges, you're not going to get statistics out of judges, so you're not going to get it out of that part of the court system. But the clerk, <coughs> the clerk is the custodian of the records for filings in your county, okay? Just like the police are custodians of the records for arrest in their municipality. So. Do we hear that court watching? Yeah, we're going to do that right now. <laughs> so, uh, can you put the, uh, uh, the, the document, the uh, court watch form? Oh, which one? That's all right. Yeah. And there's one in your package. Yeah. We'll throw that up there. So, okay, so, I, in my opinion, court watching is, is very simple. Okay? Uh, it's passive in one sense, in that you're not. You may, but generally you're not interacting with anyone, right? You're not a party, you're not a witness, okay? Uh, but you're sitting in the courtroom. And we always encourage, not required, we encourage people not to go down with 10 people, and not to go down by themselves, but to go down with a partner, okay? And the partner, it's nice to have a partner, because they may hear something that, that you didn't hear, vice versa, when you're after a particular hearing and you're and you're completing a form that we suggest to use, you can help you help each other fill it out. Okay. The form is not in your packet. No, so. Oh, okay. So, it's, so you have to so. What kind of form is it? Uh, Iowa's is in the whole packet. Okay. This is a, yeah. So the Iowa one I think is they they they've taken the Iowa, the Des Moines Court Watch form and modified it for your county. Okay. So, so, so you go down, as it, you go, you have some kind of training. We're going to start the training here, maybe you're going to have a little bit more. Not complicated. And you're going down, 
as an interested observer, right? Uh, with enough information so that you have some sense after a time or two going down what actually happened in front of you, okay? And so with this form, it's pretty simple. And we have a database that we put our results into. Uh, I figure what it's called, it's a very simple thing that, um, that allows you input the data and you can spit out a spreadsheet. I don't do that data work. But it's very simple, you know, your name is the court watcher, the date, the courtroom number, uh, the case number, okay? So one thing you gotta figure out in your county is, is how they identify a case. In, in Poe County, my county, juvenile cases are JV and then the number, okay? So you've gotta find out the, the things you're hearing, and you may not see anything in writing anywhere. Okay, um, I don't know if with your juvenile, even it's sometimes it's even hard to find. Uh, well, first of all, what we give every court watcher is just a list of the juvenile courtrooms. Okay, what's the number? Who's the presiding judge for that courtroom? Okay, and then you go to that courtroom. But there may not be anything on the outside of that courtroom that lists the hearings that are going to be held that day. Okay, uh, they should. Some places are better than others about that. Some judges are better than that than others about that. You go to Cook County Courthouse, and as huge as that system is, they have kiosks on every floor of the main Cook County Courthouse, and you can find out exactly what's going on in every courtroom. You know, I don't know what your county courthouse is, what is, but that's another piece that your research team should figure out for you, if you have one, is where are the courtrooms, who are the judges, what is the information can I get ahead of time, can I even call down to the clerk of court the morning of and find out what are the juvenile hearings today? Or are there juvenile hearings today? Or when does the first one start? You don't want to be down there at 8 if the first hearing's at 10. You know? There's no need for that, right? So, yes? I was told that our juvenile court hearings are closed to the public. Yeah, who told you that? I was told that yesterday at our court clerk about this. Okay, have you looked at the law? No, <laughs> I've not yet read that law. Okay. Oh, that's well, Jackson. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what most people thought in our community until we looked at the law. I mean, I knew what the law was as a prosecutor. Uh, but we looked at the law, and on the back, we have badges that we wear. Amos Court Watcher, an initiative of Mid-Iowa Organizing Strategy, and the name. And on the back is the Iowa Code section, Right to Observe Juvenile Hearings. Okay, so if you're questioned, you flip the badge over and say, well, wait a minute, you know, I've been looking at the law. And uh, the law says I have a right to be here, okay? Mm -hmm. They would love present company accepted. Many of them would not like to have you in their courtrooms, right? What are they afraid of? I mean, that's a question, right? The good judges, quite frankly, welcome us. The ones who have sort of a reputation of being ineffective, incompetent, disrespectful, um, they certainly don't want you sitting there, you know. But you've got to look at the law, you know, and know the law and have a copy of the law. Ideally, have a badge if that's if you go to this level, you know. So let's talk about that real quick. So here is the. It's actually it says Iowa Code Section two thirty two thirty nine exclusion of public from hearings. That's the way it's captioned. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it says at any time during the proceedings, the court, on the motion of any of the parties or on the court's own motion, may exclude the public from hearings under this division. So first of all, there's a presumption. That, that it is open unless you're excluded, okay? So may exclude the public from hearings under this division if the court determines, if, so, and there's a, sort of a two-prong thing, if the court determines that the possibility of damage or harm to the child outweighs the public's interest in having an open hearing. Well, in our experience, the only person who ever says that is the prosecutor, okay? But then it goes on. Upon closing the hearing to the public, okay, the court may admit those persons who have a direct interest in the case, relative, friend, or whatever. This is the clincher. Or as a direct interest in the work of the court. <laughs> and that catches everything. Because that's what your interest in being there is. You're not going there because of this particular boy being prosecuted or whatever. You're going there because you have an interest in the court. How it operates. Yes. Sure. I just want to say we're 
whatever's going on with the juvenile courts, and there's some question about a state law here, that we'll have to investigate, at least we know we can go into the adult courts. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I will tell you, with two and a half years' experience, that some of our people have been intimidated. Okay? okay. And we've had meetings with the chief judge about that, and it's gotten reconciled, you know, it's gotten taken care of, you know. Uh, but court attendants, for whatever reason, think it's their courtroom, not the public's, you know. And, uh, and even if they don't explicitly tell you you can't be there, you sort of get a cold shoulder. So you, know, you got to have sort of a stiff spine uh, a little bit. So anyway, so the case number, uh, and then there's different things you want to track. You know, what time was it supposed to start? Okay, scheduled start time. When did it actually start? So is our system running smoothly? Okay. Well, one reason it doesn't run smoothly is because it's overcrowded. <laughs> okay, so we want to know the difference between scheduled start and actual start. Okay, and then you put that in a database and you get some trends. Okay. Uh, uh, the type of court proceeding. I'm not sure what you call them here. If it's adjudication, it could be a detention hearing, uh, could be initial hearing, initial appearance, detention hearing, could be a uh, adjudication hearing, disposition hearing, review hearing. Those are the typical terms. So your research team should get you a list of, of the, if it's juvenile court, what are the hearings that occur in a juvenile court, you know? When do they occur? Not day of the week, but when do they occur in the processing of the case? And, and, and what, what happens at this kind of hearing? What happens at an adjudication hearing? Well, that's where the kid usually enters a plea of guilty or there is a trial. You know, disposition hearing is where the, the kid is told what the consequence is. It's not called a sentencing like in the adult court. It's a disposition. Okay? But, but you need to know when you need to have a, a, a little cheat sheet. We give our people a little, uh, just a little folder so that they know uh, the courtroom numbers, the judges presiding, and another sheet of paper, uh, common terms, okay, definitions, that kind of thing, you know. Um, so if you've seen them, you have some understanding. So when you go into a hearing and you find out, oh, this is a disposition hearing, you know what that is. The kid's already pled guilty or been found guilty, and now the judge is going to impose a consequence. Okay. So you need to know the type of court proceeding. And then you need to know the offenses charges, right? Is it a trespass? Is it assault? Is it a, is it a burglary? Is it a motor vehicle theft? You know, and, uh, so you might also have a list of the most common offenses that, that come in. And um, it's, it's really helpful to have these things typed up and right there for you because things go quickly. And they're, not, they're, they're certainly not speaking at the level so that they can make sure that you hear what they're saying. Okay. And it's sort of this fraternity. Everybody knows each other in juvenile court for the most part. Probation officers and the prosecutor, defense attorneys. You know, it is somewhat of a closed club, you know, not legally, but by practice. So uh, they're not there to make sure that you understand. We, we, I would say, we have two of our six judges. We have two, though, who are really good about making sure that everybody in the courtroom understands what's going on. Why are we here? What happened the last time we were here? You know, et cetera. And uh, uh, part of court watching, quite frankly, is is uh, putting the court on notice that you have an interest in how they do business, and, and as a result, we've seen we've seen an incremental increase in the level of respect afforded people in the courtroom. It's been significant. That's what our court records report. Uh, this judge judge is nicer than when we first came in here. You know, now maybe it only happens when there's a court watcher there. You don't know, but you would like to think that they develop a habit, right? recognition. The public has a right to come in, observe, make their own determination as to what's going on, etc. So, uh, but, but you, you want to have some things in a packet, in a little notebook, so that, you know, you know what kind of hearing it is. You know, you know, you, you know what charge is being considered here, or whatever. Uh, and then how much time was in the courtroom, <coughs> and the date of the next appearance. Um, Oftentimes you'll find you'll get interested in a particular case and you'll want to stay with it, you know. And 
And uh, hopefully, at that, at the conclusion of the hearing that you're in, you know, you're going to, uh, there's another hearing that's going to be set, unless the case is going to be closed, okay? So, uh, and then maybe we can go up, can we go? I'm yours, Oh, sorry. Okay, then we get down to, and we've talked about this locally. Um, uh, I don't, at least in Iowa and Maine, where we're, we don't call a child a defendant, okay? Uh, so you have to decide what name to use. But here it's defendant, and that's the child, the accused, right? Uh, and then race and gender. Really important to get that, that data, okay? So you begin to collect the data, particularly on race, but gender as well. Um, and then we want to know everybody's race and gender. <laughs> you know, we want to know for the judge. Okay, first of all, for the judge, is it a judge? Is it a magistrate? Is it a referee? Okay, uh, who the judge was, race and gender. The prosecutor, same thing. Defense attorney, uh, whether it's a public defender or a privately retained lawyer, race and gender. Okay, and um, and then there's some basic yes, no questions or not applicable. Uh, are all four named persons, four named persons, I'm not sure where the four named persons come. Defendant, judge, prosecutor, defense attorney. Oh, I see. Okay, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, I hope the judge is there. Uh, I'm not sure how you can have, well, you can. I, yeah, I can say, you can have a defense attorney not show up, yeah. particularly. Well, right. the video or uh, in the immigration court, there was the judge that, uh, Lawyer was on the phone. The uh, victim was, I mean, the defender was on a video, and the judge was in the front. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of that. So, yeah, and uh, and you'll find out soon enough to what extent is video you can use in right. a juvenile court here or not. Um, you'll, you'll find out. Yeah. That's true. But, so, uh, is the defendant in custody? Meaning, has it been brought to the courtroom? by corrections people, somebody from the detention center. Uh, and then I would also add, and you can make a comment down here about this, did they come in handcuffs? Did they come in ankle shackles? Did they come in prison guard? You know, uh, you really need to begin watching for that because anybody can ask the question, wait a minute, he's got ankle restraints on, handcuffs on, he's in an orange jumpsuit, and uh, he was, here for a minor in possession of alcohol, you know, or public intox, or petty theft, and we're treating him like he's in prison, you know. So you begin to, so you want to, you want to note that, you know, is he in custody? So if he's in custody, what what are what are the indicia of, of being in custody? You know, how do you know he's in custody? Well, you usually know he's in custody because he's got handcuffs on, you know, and he's in a jumpsuit or something. So and then. Was he in custody after the proceeding? Did, did the hearing result in a release from custody? Okay. Yes or no? Uh, are the parents present? Big deal. Okay. Yes or no? You know, to what extent is their family support? You know, and then you're able to see, you know, are, you know, is there any connection? Is there any connection between race, gender, age, between having family support or not? You can at least begin to look at the data after a period of time and see if there's any. Any trend or not? Okay. Uh, is English your primary language? Uh, if not, is there an interpreter present? Oftentimes, English is not the primary language, and there is an interpreter. Or more often than not, it's not the primary language of the parents. And yet, the parents, there is an interpreter there for the parents, so they're clueless as to what's happening with their child. Okay. The question is, the defendant here to understand the court proceedings. Okay. It's sort of hard to know until, unless you have to go outside the courtroom and you hear a conversation afterward and the boy or girl saying, what happened in there? You know, you know I, I, what happened? You know, and that's not just for juveniles, by the way. You know, I mean, it's probably more often than not that somebody comes out of the courtroom, particularly the sort of the mass courtrooms where there's a lot of stuff going on, case after case after case, and people don't know what happened to them. They don't know what their allegations are now going forward from what, what was said. So, uh, yeah, do they appear to not? And then 
I would just suggest if you answer that no, they didn't appear to know what was going on, that you comment on that. You know, why, why do you think that? You know, what, what made you believe that he or she didn't understand? Um, does the case involve a victim? Is the victim present? A relationship to the defendant? Could be a sibling, could be a parent, could be a stranger, you know, could be a classmate, you know, whatever. Uh, but that tells you something about the offense. It might then, it might then raise some questions about, uh, wait a minute, if this was within the family, couldn't we have handled this some other way? Did we really need to have a crime? You know, because, you know, a boy was upset, maybe high, pushed his dad, and now we're in court on a delinquency, you know? There has to be some response, right? We've got a family with some issues, but it need, did it need to come here? Was there another form, another venue, a, a mediation, you know, a circle that, you know, you so you, of course, not set up for that. But if you begin to ask that question often enough and bring it to the attention of people and say, well, there seems to be a real need here. We've been court watching for a year and we're seeing these cases come in that What's the court doing to resolve it? You know, you know, the resolution comes from coming together and having conversations. You know, so why, why here? Why in the courtroom? Um, is the defendant dressed in street clothes or not? Okay. Well, and that one really goes to is the defendant in custody or not? So you might just you could put that move that one up to the custodian part. Okay. Okay. So that's that's page one, and then on the flip side is an evaluation. Of the, of the professionals, okay? And uh, it's probably, you all, do you, you, is that in your package? Do you say no, no or not? No. no. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Oh, well, that's, no, that's right. Um, so, um, and a lot of people didn't really like it that we're evaluating, <laughs> you know. Uh, but why not? I mean, don't we have a right? We're paying, number one, it's taxpayers' dollars. So we have a right to expect competency. Do you show them beforehand, or yeah, we end up we end up giving them to them, sure. Yeah, I mean, they, I think that's fair that they know what we're doing when we're there, you know. And so, yeah, all the judges have it. Prosecutors end up getting it, you know. And um, some are absolutely fine, you know, and uh, and some don't like it, right? Yeah. The, the state of Arizona actually uh, had a constitutional amendment, and all judges in that state are given a public report card. And everyone who uses that court, everyone who works at that court, everyone who has any kind of contact with that judge, it's an independent third party who takes all that information, puts it on a public website. Now, if a judge's report card he starts getting failing grades, there's an intervention. There's a judge, there's a lawyer, and there's a person who will talk to that judge and say, hey, something's going on here that the public doesn't like. And, yeah. you know, that needs to be some change. I mean, that's good to hear. It, it, that, that, uh, that's called transparency. That's, that's called transparency. <laughs> we, you know, we don't have that, but I will tell you what happened was the when they added the sixth juvenile judge uh, who came in, um, she was mean to people, okay? Did not have a courtroom demeanor, and it went on for a few months, and our court watchers just kept documenting, documenting, documenting that. And finally, the chief judge assigned, we found out that this happened, uh, the chief judge assigned the best of the six female judges to mentor that, that new judge. And in a couple, three months, we really began to see a difference, you know? And I don't think it would have happened without court watching. Yeah. Um, I'd like to clarify the question that you answered over here. You said you gave the judges the form. Yeah. I'm assuming it was the blank form. I mean, the form. Right. No, we don't give them the completed form. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. No, no, we have not turned over to anyone uh, other than general data. We issued a report, uh, but we don't use names in the report. We just you know, the collected the aggregate data. We've made public, but not, uh, but not the names of it. Yeah. So, who did you send that data to? Uh, we had, we had an annual conference training, and we made it available. And I think a couple of judges actually came. Uh, we did not send it. We sent 
we did a lot of letters to the editor to the Joint Register, but we didn't. Uh -huh. I don't think we turned that report over to them. Not state level or anything. No, 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 we didn't. We, we didn't think, um, uh, you know, it's still somewhat in the experimental phase. Yeah. And we didn't think we had it refined enough mm -hmm. to uh, to present it officially to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, good questions. Um, yes. How do you document that somebody is mean? Just that your perception was that the judge was mean, or do you? That's all you can do. Try to right. be, more, be more. Yeah. Respectful. I mean, there's no uh, there's no guidelines. I mean, it's what it's, it's just what you think. Yeah. You know, it's what it's what you. You go together. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And we have a scale from one to five here of how mean or how you play. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and this rating schedule actually came from, I think, the New Orleans court watch program. It's called NOLA. Uh, it's a pretty good one. I hear mm -hmm. Cook County's is really good. Uh, but New Orleans has a really nice one, too. And I think that's, I think that's, we got our scale from there. Uh, people didn't like horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway. So, um, and I won't read all of these, but, uh, for the most part, we're not, we're not rating legal competence. Because I don't think we can read that at all. We can't see what the scale is. Okay, well, the scale is one is horrible, two needs improvement, three average, four above average, five excellent, and then and a not applicable. So, how well did the judge appear to pay attention to the proceedings? I mean, I've seen judges fall asleep. Okay, I remember clerking for a judge who fell asleep on a regular basis and would drool on it. Oh, no. We didn't have court watching then, but it happened. <laughs> uh, he also carried a gun. <laughs> How understandable were the judge's remarks and did they make sense? Well, that's a legitimate thing to monitor because you know, you've got people leaving your courtroom after hearing and they're clueless really as to what happened or what their obligations are. Uh, it's not a good thing. How well did the judge make explanations to the participants? How well did the judge show respect to the victim, respect to the defendant, respect to the prosecutor, uh, to the defendant's attorney? Did the judge appear to favor either side? It does happen. You know, you've got people that come into a judge's courtroom regularly and they sort of, they sort of suck up a little bit, you know? And uh, you want to know, is that a pattern or not? Did the judge appear to figure side? Was the judge attentive when the participants spoke? Did the judge explain the next steps in the legal process at the end of the court proceedings? And, uh, I'd say more times than not, they get good ratings. I mean, we found, we found, I think we found the overall rating for judges was between three and four. So average to above average, in the aggregate, not for individual judges, but all the judges together, and they're at least average, if not better. Okay, so it's not like we have horrible judges. Uh, but we need to know what we do or not. Uh, and then, you, then you rate the prosecutor. Was the prosecutor prepared? And I would say, when I inherited my position as a juvenile prosecutor, juvenile bureau prosecutor, um, those prosecutors were consistently criticized for not being prepared because they had so many cases. And, uh, uh, how organized was the prosecutor? How understandable were the prosecutor's remarks? Did they make sense? How well did the prosecutor show respect to the victim? How well did the prosecutor show respect to the defendant? I mean, oftentimes you respect. They treat a defendant, even a youth, with disdain. You know, not appropriate. You're a public servant. You know. Um, Excuse me. So, and so on and so, and so forth. And so on and so forth. Right. Uh, show respect to witnesses, defense attorney, blah, blah, blah. And then you go down, and there is uh, defendant attorney's evaluation. And uh, pretty much the same questions. And you've added jury's evaluation. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So what, what you've done here, what this form is for both juvenile and adult court. The form that we use, 90% of our court watching is in juvenile court. But we also encourage people, if they had time, go see what, go, go sit in on a jury trial. Go sit in on guilty plea, you know. Uh, see to what extent there's a good, what we call a plea colloquy between the judge and the defendant. Uh, the, the more the better. 
Uh, <coughs> the question is, 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 will most of your efforts be directed to uh, enhancing, reforming, humanizing the juvenile system? And we made that decision, uh, not to the exclusive of others, but we just thought we could, we could gather momentum by focusing on the juvenile justice process. Joe? Yeah, so one thing I'm confused about, in here as elsewhere, you know, probably 90% of the cases are really resolved by the prosecutors with the defense lawyers outside the courtroom. And all they're coming into the courtroom to, is to announce whatever was agreed upon. So you're not hearing... Are you talking about juvenile or adult? I'm talking about adult. Okay. Uh, so because more happens in a juvenile court room, in my experience, even if it's going to result in a guilty plea, because you're okay. looking at additional. Issues. So it just it makes it hard to then evaluate. You know, it's like all the key. I mean, I see the judges being significantly not that involved. I mean, they're kind of just reviewing this agreement, but they've not heard. You know, necessarily. The, I mean, I've read stuff. Over, anyway, it would make it hard for court watchers to figure out what's really going on. Well, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, if you go into the courtroom, if you've got a designated courtroom that, at least on certain days of the week, handles all the drunk driving cases, there might be 150 cases that go through that courtroom that day. Uh, uh, you're going to be able to track everyone? No. It's important that you see what's it look like in a courtroom on one day in which 150 people are processed? Yes. Yeah. Is that justice? No. Is, you know, what, what is this thing that's happening here? So you so, just go in and do the best you can to witness to what's happening. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yes. In education, when you're reading a group of teachers or evaluating essays, there's training as to if you read, all read the same essay, and four people are given ones and twos, and the fifth person is given fours and fives. You know, something's the guidelines must have been, you know, explained enough. Is there so any kind of training on sort of making sure on the, on the uh, evaluation form itself? I mean, sort of. You know, yeah, we, when we do a two-hour training, we spend more time on that. Then the other thing that we do. Uh, sort of lapsed in the last few months, but for the first couple of years, regularly, we would have a, a, a monthly um, sort of brown bag lunch to process experience. <coughs> and then in addition to the brown bag lunch thing, uh, we probably had a half a dozen evening follow-up trainings. Mm -hmm. Because we're just learning as we go. And, and I think the point that you just brought up, Terry, is a, is a very valid one. You know? and, and some people tend to be just they may understand or not, or they just may be a more of a critical type <laughs> than somebody else. And there are some people that don't want anybody to come across as not being good, you know. And, and that's not helpful either, actually, if, if you don't want to offend anybody, you know. Uh, uh, so really all you can do is just, talk, is just talk through it on a regular basis. And I know our people found it really helpful to have, uh, not every four watcher would come to every monthly brown bag meeting. But many, many were very regular, and then we would try to get most everybody uh, that was active to come to one of the evening follow-up trainings, you know. Uh, because questions arise that just weren't even thought of during the training process. Yeah. Yes? Is there a number that you would say would be a critical mass of amount of hours per week court watch in this size, or an amount of uh, hours per week, or, you know, just yeah. As you're collecting these data and learning your system. That's a really good question. I mean, obviously, everybody's a volunteer, so nothing's mandatory, but we really encourage people to go down at least 10 half days over a several month period. You know? And a half day is a good time to do And uh, when, uh, like, I teach court watching to a restorative justice class at Drake University, an honors class at the undergraduate level, we've done it three times. and. Uh, and the requirement in that class is that they go, that they observe at least 10 hearings. Okay. Not necessarily go 10 times, but observe 10 hearings. And in addition to that, that's sort of for each individual's experience on it, but then as a community, that in terms of our 
covering these, as you mentioned, there may be a full day of traffic court, and this court, and that court. Any sense of, you know, what kind of critical mass of, of people in our court watching the program yeah. should be aiming for? Um, again, a good question. I know when we did our first annual report, I think we had data on roughly 400 cases observed. You know, 400 of these forms were inputted. Okay, so we had that. I heard from Carolyn that in Cook County, it's like 7,000 for over a two-year period. You know, uh, uh, I know when I've talked to the director of the Court Watch program in New Orleans, at any one time. They have about 60 regulars, okay, and um, so you do have to have, I think, a, a, a critical number. And one thing as a community organization that we're sort of grappling with is is is, is really trying to get somebody at least part time to manage it, you know, uh, because everything's volunteer, right? So we need a part time manager uh, who will also recruit. It's great having college students and retired people down there at the same time. It's, it's just wonderful. And sometimes they'll partner up. And um, so you even get relationships developed out of the court watch experience. You know. and, uh, yes? Is it important to try and get a cross section of the overall community in your court watching group or you don't think that matters? Oh no, I think the, the more the, the more the better. I mean most of our most of our court watchers have come out of one of the you know the, the 30 churches that are part of our organizing effort uh, or college students okay and um, but I've thought about going into the high schools and offering the training you know particularly for have kids go down and watch juvenile court you know uh, we haven't done that yet um, but, but I think that's a, that's a policy but I absolutely a process can be good I'm, I'm getting a uh, sort of a training to 80 Kiwanis people in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to offer to do a court watch. I'm doing a research desk training, and I'm going to offer to do a court watch training and train, train them. I did a training for 15 African American ministers uh, uh, last summer, you know. So, yeah, good cross section, absolutely. You know, age, socioeconomic. How many other trainers are there besides you? Uh, zero. <laughs> other people in, in our work do other kinds of training. So we have we have school mediation trainers. We've got racial profiling trainers. And, you know, we've got circle trainers. But because I'm really the only prosecutor in our I mean organizing group, or then, then it's you know that's, I'm called upon to do this. You know, I do other trainings, but the court watch thing, um, and it's sort of hard to get your your head around sometimes. We, I, I mentioned earlier that we've got this guy, Bob Glass, he's 70, he's our data geek. But I did, I sat down with him four different times to try to explain how a case goes through the juvenile justice system, because it just doesn't stick, you know. It's like I wouldn't know so many things I don't know, right? You know, that I would have to be told a half a dozen times, you know. So we just don't have other people in our pretty extensive group of volunteers who've been inside the system long enough yeah. to, to know, so, yes? Have we gotten inquiries from any other county prosecutors or um, people throughout the country who are interested in what you've been doing? Well, county prosecutors are not interested. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, absolutely, other people have, that's for sure. I was in Arkansas a few weeks ago and did a training at the Unitarian Church. Were like judges, I mean? Yes, there were judges. There, there, there were judges, and in fact, <coughs> Yeah, in fact, there's a judge who actually is a district court judge in northern Arkansas that's going to have me come down and do a half-day training for judges. And yeah, no, judges are interested, I, but I've not had prosecutors. Uh, although, I will tell you, I, I take that back a little bit. I did a circle about a month ago with a kid who made an anonymous threat to the school superintendent to go to school with a gun and do damage because he'd been bullied. And they evacuated the entire school district of 3,000 kids for three days. Nice. Locked the kid up for six months and finally called our restorative justice center in Portland and said, we come and do a, a healing circle. We need a healing circle in the aftermath of this. And the prosecutor who um, prosecuted the boy participated in the circle and she was great. 
and afterwards just raved about it within the prosecutor's office. It was a wonderful opportunity to bring in uh, a prosecutor. Defense attorney is a good defense attorney, but never been in a restorative process before. The chief juvenile court probation officer participated, or observed, but didn't, wasn't in the circle. The superintendent was there. It was an incredible thing to have these public people who were directly affected. Usually you don't have public people directly affected by an offense, but in this case it did. And, um, uh, but that's the first time I've had a prosecutor participate in something like that. Yeah. Did uh, the, when you initiated this in, in Iowa um, for court work, <coughs> is it folks just started showing up in courtrooms, or where did you uh, officially? Oh, no, no, you couldn't, do, I mean, we didn't endorse anybody, certify anybody, so to speak, unless they got through the training, mm -hmm. and we issued them a badge. <laughs> but I mean, as far as the court, did they get, people just started going after they were trained or whatever, did the court get any kind of official uh, notification of this, this program being? <coughs> no, not an official notification. They knew, I mean, it's a small community, a courthouse. <laughs> right. You know, it, it, uh, it, it spread quickly, you know, and uh, uh, and there were probably four newspaper articles, significant newspaper articles in the first couple of months. Those are in the packet. And they're, yeah, they're yeah. So uh, it, it got a lot of attention and very much endorsed by Iowa's largest newspaper. This is a, this is a civic right, a civic duty to take an interest in what justice looks like in your community. And that's our whole push about it. I mean, you get the justice you deserve. I mean, you have to keep responsibility to the system. And don't take an interest, don't educate yourself, and don't provide input, and we get what we get, right? And, uh, yeah, so, yes. Have you written a book or a pamphlet, something like that, that uh, we can purchase or well, I, I mentioned this earlier. I, I, I didn't as, as my last class in the graduate work I was doing on conflict transformation, Howard Zayer, the Godfather of Restorative Justice, was my advisor, and we agreed that I would write a book uh, on my sort of year and a half experience driving around the country talking to people about the justice system. So uh, this book, The Justice Diary, Inquiring into Justice in America. Uh, I'll, I'll leave cards up here. The books are too heavy to carry. Um, but I'll leave cards. It's pretty cheap on Amazon. And it's got several entries are about court watching. Uh, you know, and so you can sort of see the progression from uh, a very early entry in which I went down and observed a. a uh, so I went down, you know, I've been in the courtroom for years, but I never sat back in the courtroom as an observer. So a friend of mine. Attorney said, Fred, he knew I had a training coming up, the first one, three years ago, January. He said, Fred, I know you got that training coming up that you're going to do, uh, but we go down and court watch this Friday on a juvenile case, in which, and then he went on and on about why somebody needed to see what was going on in this particular courtroom. So then I, I wrote a, a, it was as bad as he said, and I wrote a letter to the Des Moines Register and it published, and that sort of opened things up pretty quickly. And then we had two or three letters to the editor by ministers who had been trained as court watchers, and those got in the paper too. And that just sort of ramped, ramped things up pretty quickly locally too. Uh, and over 12 months, the Des Moines Register did many, many articles submitted by our group as well as their own editorials. In fact, got a national award on their coverage on juvenile justice. Uh, so the paper is a big tool. Right. I just want to mention that book is fun to read and well written. <laughs> so I don't know where we are time wise. Yeah, yeah, about six minutes. Yeah. 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 Just in terms of the court watching and instituting, it seems to me you need a pilot to work out not only the questions, but how people feel. Could I do this? How did I feel? Otherwise, you're going to give it to everyone at once. They're going to feel dissatisfied. Or, you know, do you work out the cake sort of with a small group first? Yeah, that, that, looking back, that's what we did. I mean, I've probably done eight to ten trainings, but the very first one, three years ago, January, the first Presbyterian in Des Moines, we had 20 people, pretty much hand-picked, okay? I think half of them were ministers uh, of our or participating congregations. 
uh, a couple of retired lawyers, a couple of retired school teachers. But it was it was that first training. It was twenty and fifty. Practice on the floor. I'm saying you got to go out there. Nice to learn. Oh no no they they, they went the next week. And then you then you got to come back. That's right. Right. That's why we have the monthly meetings there That's to process. Cover that. Yeah. To cover that. Yeah. Was there an event in Iowa that that motivated these thirty congregations to come together around this issue? Um, well, just quickly. So uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you know Saul Linsky, sort of the yeah. last century yes. great yeah. community organizer, and he started the Industrial Areas Foundation (IAF). So there's presently about sixty IAF affiliates in the country. I think Dearborn is is in the organizational stage with an IAF. So Amos in Des Moines, a mid-Iowa organizing strategy, is an IAF affiliate, and has been in Des Moines about 15 years, and has worked on mental health, fair housing, but it was four years ago, in doing a number of home meetings, that this issue of, of juvenile justice just kept coming up, coming up, coming up. How, how are kids are being treated? What's happening to them? The, the unintended consequences. So that, the, the organization didn't get created because of juvenile justice. The do not justice in the last few years has been right at the top. Yeah. Are you going to expand this into the adult program? Well, again, there's so much, that's your choice, number one. Yeah. And our court watches, some have an interest in that. But there's so much work to be done on the juvenile level. Yeah. We believe. I mean, we, we want court filings to go down. Exactly. We want school mediation to become the norm. You know, we want any justice circles to become the norm. You know, so if we leave this issue too early, we haven't done our work. You know, we have. It all feeds into the adults anyway. It all feeds into the adults. That's the point. Yeah. You know, if you don't deal with it here, you're going to deal with it there. Right. Right. 